So thank you, everyone. I'm Joya Delgado Harris, Executive Director of Cancer Gold Standard at CEO Roundtable. It's a pleasure to have you all join us today. Um, we have a few housekeeping items that we wanted to share with you. We, want, we intend for this to be an interactive discussion and really want you to um, ask questions to our panelists. Um, we, um, we'll have a chat box open, of course, and questions can be placed there. Um, and um, as a reminder, today's webinar will be recorded so that we may share it in the future. So really thrilled to have you join, as I've said a couple of times, and um, look forward to a robust discussion. One note, um, unfortunately, Dr. Yolanda Page with Dillard University's Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Center is unable to participate today, but she sends her regards. Um, she um, leads, well, she's VP of Academic Affairs at Dillard, and she also uh, is the acting director of the Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Center there. And their mission is to take a comprehensive approach to advancing research across disciplinary areas to enhance and promote coordination and collaboration throughout the scientific community and to improve the overall quality of health for racial and ethnic minorities. So I'm sure if she was here, she would uh, definitely mention that how important data collaboration is. And um, it would, she would definitely add a lot of, um, of insight um, from the academic community to this conversation. So she does send her regards, but I um, look forward to a, a fine, fine presentation um, from our esteemed panelists. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. John McDunn, who is Executive Director of External Control Arm Program in Business Development at Project Data Sphere. And John, please take it away. Well, thanks, Joya. Um, like Joy said, I'm here at Project Data Sphere, and I, I run one of our research programs. Uh, and this is a, a bigger group with, uh, we're a component of the CEO Roundtable on Cancer. And together, the CEO Roundtable and Project Data Sphere work to make clinical trials data available for secondary analyses and to, uh, to improve patient care and streamline the development of new medicines. Um, as you know, since you registered, today's webinar is focused on putting data to work to address disparities and use those data to achieve equity in healthcare. And I'm joined by some wonderful uh, collaborators, uh, Dr. Gary Puckrin, President and CEO of the National Minority Quality Forum, and Dr. Elizabeth Heath, Hartman Endowed Chair and Director of Prostate Cancer Research and Professor of Oncology and Medicine at Carmanos Cancer Institute. So I think uh, what would be great is if we could just um, start by hearing a little bit from each of the panelists about what um, they do with data, what it, what it means to them, what kind of data they use, um, and how that can inform these questions and disparities and equity. Uh, so Dr. Puckrin, why don't you uh, start off? John, thank you so much. Um, so the National Minority Quality Forum, we are a research and education organization based here in Washington, D.C. Our work really started with collecting health data. We've been collecting it now for about 20 years. Uh, we have a database of over 5 billion patient records. We collect data on about 160 million lives a year, covering well over 100,000 different conditions. Um, we mainly work with claims data, though we uh, also have some uh, clinical data as well. Uh, and with that data, we try to understand um, health disparities, um, both in terms of patient outcomes, guideline-directed care, uh, and we use it for advocacy, for uh, quality improvement. Uh, we peer review lots of papers. And what we're trying to do is add a scientific base uh, to the work around um, eliminating health disparities. Well, thank you, Dr. Pockrin. Uh, Dr. Heath, can you pick up the thread and talk a little bit about uh, what you do and, and how the data within a healthcare ecosystem can inform or address some of these same kinds of concerns? Absolutely. So much thanks goes to you, John, and to Joya, and all the folks at CEO Roundtable. I admire what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for those listening and on the webinar, I am a practicing medical oncologist, and I have a specialty in genital urinary cancers. Um, I've been at uh, the Hermanos Cancer Institute now for 19 years and really find it a blessing and an honor to be able to take care of these folks. Um, that, that we serve. Um, you know, to that end, my passion is really in drug development, and that means a whole lot of different clinical trials have come through our center, uh, 
with me as either principal investigator or co-investigator. And that in itself, um, over the many, many years of me doing this, has generated just incredible amounts of data. But of course, they are not put into one data warehouse. It's really quite specific to each uh, individual trial. And of course, you know, John, um, that in the world of oncology, a whole other data set is brewing in genomics and genetics and everything precision medicine. So that has really taken off, I think, in the last five to 10 years, also giving us different opportunities to talk about in terms of large data. So thanks for, thanks for having me here, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Great, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that I've found is, is that there, it's very difficult to prioritize kind of the work that we do, and how do you, you know, go far enough um, down a, a, a road to do something impactful. So I know, uh, Dr. Puckern, maybe you can uh, speak to one of the projects that you all have, have done that's been particularly um, impactful. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I, I want to say that um, we have still a long way to go in the whole world of data sharing and data collecting. Uh, I've been collecting health data um, for a lot of years, and what you should know is that my background is actually in history. I were not in this medical field, but my doctor is actually in history. And as a historian, what you come to appreciate is a good archive. Uh, and a good archive um, should be able to help a researcher answer a question uh, when they have a question and try to be as agnostic to the question as uh, as possible. And so when you try to collect health data, um, it is incredibly difficult. It, it is so siloed. There are so many owners of data sets um, that it really creates a problem. And the problem is um, that we don't, we need data to learn. Uh, and if we can't bring all of that data together, uh, it's, it's very hard for us to learn. And in, in some way, uh, we're going to have to move health data around a lot quicker and make it a lot more available uh, than it is right now. So we at the National Minority Quality Forum, here's how we use health data. There are roughly 38,000 zip codes in the United States where people live. 70% of African Americans live in 2,500 zip codes. 70% of Hispanics live in 2,500 zip codes. 50% of Asians live in 1,500 zip codes. So out of the 38,000 zip codes, the minority populations in the country reside in roughly about 8,000 zip codes. And so no one was really collecting that data at the zip code level to understand what was happening to minority populations. So that's what we've been doing. We've been very much focused on the geography where uh, underserved uh, minority populations live, uh, and then try to understand why are they being underserved? What do their outcomes look like? Um, how can we improve um, uh, 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 their, their outcomes? And by that, keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of the emergency room, improve the quality of their life. And so we, we take that data-driven perspective by, by bringing the data down to the geography and then try to understand uh, how can we improve outcomes for patients? I imagine of those 100,000 conditions that you're tracking, there's a, a good amount of, of cancer that is present in that. And how does that kind of shape up with the, the uh, populations? Um, so we, we have been mapping cancer geographically. We started uh, with the first moonshot um, uh, uh, with President Biden. So we provided the data backbone for that. Uh, we call them indexes, uh, and we map uh, various cancers by, by geography. And one of the things that happens when you start to map cancers by geography, you realize that cancer has a geographical face, uh, that, that the risk for cancer is not the same in all geographies. It's not the same in all populations. Uh, and so if you want to really improve cancer uh, research and, and improve cancer outcomes, you first have to understand what's the geography, what's happening down at that geography, because it's that interplay between our biology and the environment that is driving cancer risk. Uh, and so that's what we're paying attention to by bringing the data down to those geographies and then understanding uh, what's happening and how do we make good in, uh, 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 inputs. 
John, can I just interject there? You know, I'm just listening to you, Dr. Parker, and what you're saying is just so insightful. Um, you know, as oncologists, we tend to treat at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, patients already have the problem. We're trying to change that outcome to be better, but there's so much against it, you know, whether it's cancer burden or just even uh, available treatments. Um, as the American Cancer Society now under the helm of uh, Dr. Karen Knudsen, you know, we, we had a terrific lecture at our most recent meeting at uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology Genital Urinary Cancers meeting that just happened a few days ago was this realization that we have to get down to the community level to make this impact. And that's where I think your knowledge base is so critical. You know, part of our struggle in cancer is once somebody does get that, the representation of patients actually either getting access to have this, you know, let's say a genomic panel run or anything in that uh, level of testing, the disparity there is even greater. Um, so forget the trials that uh, folks have known about where just the accrual has been up to snuff, but now you're trying to get to more fancy data, uh, you know, the, the innovation where everyone's excited about, but you're still getting inadequate representation. So the data I think that um, Dr. Parker and your organization is really looking at is the why. You know, the barrier isn't even just access to care, it may just be knowledge uh, deficit that there is this thing, you know, that we have to offer and do and educate. Um, and part of the struggle I think that's specific to cancer is that uh, as we were talking about before, that ball keeps getting, you know, taken away from you. You're getting closer, everyone's getting excited, and then the ball just moves down a couple of yards down. And then you're like, oh shoot, and then you're moving again. So there's always that sense of frustration that you never hit your target. Um, but the, the wonderful part about cancer, at least research and all that is, you know, the, the data is really showing that new drugs are being developed because of what the science is driving this to, but how one applies that fairly across, you know, all of our communities is still such a struggle. No, absolutely. I think this this idea about using genomics and finding new targets and developing drugs against those targets that's a, it's proven out in cancer. It's it's a tremendous step forward. Like immuno oncology has been a tremendous step forward in the treatment of patients, but I think that there are gaps in how those how patients are screened, which patients are screened, and um, and then what what therapies are available. Uh, to patients, and I think Dr. Pucker and some of your work is really uh, kind of leading in that direction. Yeah, so the way we think about the problem, it's really a problem of risk, right? Um, we all have some risk for cancer. Uh, it gets elevated by by our behavior. We smoke, uh, uh, we, you know, we uh, obese, whatever. It also gets um, uh, by the environment we, we live in. And so we're taking a look at, so what's elevating cancer risk in certain geographies. And then as you suggest, uh, in certain geographies, we don't screen um, as early as we should. Um, so the patients end up in late stage diagnosis in those geographies and their survival rates are poor, right? So there's, there's, a, tr there's a whole continuum there uh, where if we're really serious about eliminating disparities, the data can help us point to where we need to be, what part of the continuum uh, the, do we need to address? And hopefully, you know, uh, with a lot of smart people around the table, we can really start to reduce risk uh, and, and help improve uh, survival rates uh, for cancer. And John, I think one of the things that pop up a lot, you know, with that is folks with cancer um, also have sort of concomitant other comorbidities. So it's not like your diabetes gets better because you have cancer or your hypertension gets better because you have cancer. In fact, it exacerbates the problem because if you're trying to get a new cutting edge treatment or you're trying to get them on a clinical trial, you know, those are the folks that the clinical trials don't want to enroll because that risk or that, you know, situation not going the way perhaps the investigator and everybody else invested in that particular study um, it's because, you know, folks with hypertension might have worsening kidney function. 
So it's all rolled up into one. The folks who I think need to have more access to these fancy trials don't necessarily qualify because the criteria to get on is so tight. It's also not uh, developed with sort of the diversity of our population. You know, there's no nod to that, uh, that perhaps a, a slightly worsened kidney function is really not that important in the big scheme of life because once you get the drug approved, guess what? Those are the patients you're gonna treat with that condition. So having that overall view uh, that Dr. Parkin's organization is doing is I think really important because those of us in cancer focused institutions of which most national cancer institutes are in that kind of setting, uh, we sometimes don't have the bandwidth to recognize that these other you know, medical issues exist. So not even just the geography or what do you have access to, but how do we handle all of the other medical issues that patients come with? Yeah, I would just like to add uh, something to what Dr. Heath was saying, because um, uh, when it comes to clinical trials, we think it's really important now to get those trials in community um, for lots of reasons, um, uh, because they're closer um, to the uh, population. Uh, we can get greater diversity. Uh, and so certainly we at NMQF, uh, we're working to train community clinicians, particularly oncologists, and I'm saying that because we can use some help here, uh, get them uh, trained to become trialists uh, because they have the trust of the community. They're part of the community uh, and they would help us with diversity. And we need that diversity in order so that we can learn quicker uh, and um, and really make sure that we're able to generalize um, those therapies uh, once they are available. And, and certainly we've not done a good job of placing uh, healthcare in community uh, to make it accessible and create the diversity um, that we need to have if we're gonna get the best outcomes for patients. No, I think, that, oh, go ahead, Dr. Heath. No, I was just saying, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a reality I face every day, um, as we had mentioned before, you know, most uh, practicing oncologists are tethered to some health system in their community or in their state. Um, and as healthcare organizations are sort of um, expanding in all ways and all ways, um, it, it's also a little bit more challenging because, you know, there are sort of different constraints I think though training, though if you really think about how one person is trained, most oncology fellowships are to train individuals how to think about trials, how to enroll trials, um, and how to be an investigator. But once you're out into uh, practice, you know that's something that's not necessarily valued. So the value for us is of course so great and all of us today on this webinar are invested because we recognize that value. But from a practicing, you know, uh, organization, maybe you're in a four person group or a three person group, that's a huge commitment. Um, and the more complicated and complex each trial is getting, which in 2022, it's really complicated uh, with, you know, eligibility criteria ranging in the 50 different parameters you gotta to, to do, um, time invested in a practice to do that and resources become a real issue. So I think it's also the recognition from all of us in the health community that patients are getting care in their backyard. They do trust their local uh, you know, providers and how do we empower them to do that? It's certainly within our healthcare system of McLaren, something that we really take seriously. Um, Dr. Brucker, and, you know, we do have several trials that are open in our network um, but that's not without just a tremendous amount of work on everyone's part, um, because as most studies, it requires a, an investigator who knows how to run it. So more than that investment is that their office is able to have and have that infrastructure to run it well, so everyone stays safe. So there's just so many moving parts that you know, any other ideas folks have on this webinar that could help us succeed, I think is a welcome one. You know, we are, um, we're, we're painfully aware of the challenge of, of both staffing, particularly in the age of COVID, 
Um, our health systems are, are really uh, under siege. Um, and the investment that needs to be made if a practice wants to uh, become an investigator site. Um, so we can help resource them is the point I'm going to. Uh, we recognize that, um, uh, that th there, there is a risk here in terms of the investment that needs to be made. Uh, and so part of our training is also to understand uh, what the practice needs in order to be able to do clinical trials. I think the future of our medicine, you know, is that combination of making sure that um, our, um, uh, our uh, medical facilities are on the front line where people need care, uh, that, um, that is diverse in terms of, of access, and then at the back end we're collecting that data so that we create this learning community loop where we get smarter and smarter and, and faster and faster. Because at least in my world, the way I think about it, we want to accelerate knowledge growth. We want it to grow exponentially. And the only way to do that is really to set up the system for growth. And that means that uh, we have to uh, get our, um, our healthcare system in community uh, where, um, where the action is, so to speak. And, they, and then make sure we've built the infrastructure so that we're sharing that information. And that's why uh, liberating health data is so critically important, uh, because I think that's the way we're going to going to learn going forward. Yeah, I think one of those things that's really important for accelerating knowledge growth is the quality of the data. And I know both of you have a real passion for this. I've heard both of you speak to it at, uh, at different events. and. And really, to have not just the quality of the data, but the representation of the the, the totality of of the human condition, right? Because otherwise, we're going to be applying these machine learning algorithms or these other kinds of analytics approaches that are going to have a, a huge blind spot. And I think that that's something that I, I would just love for each of you to touch on a bit here in in this uh, this discussion, a little bit of, of why is quality important? Why is you know, representation critical for, for the future as we accelerate, you know, knowledge growth. Yeah, so maybe I'll start there. You know, John, you and I definitely have had multiple conversations about quality. Um, to get down to brass tacks, how you code the data elements is everything. Um, so the way I would refer to something may not be the way you would refer to it or Dr. Puckrin. And then you have these three sort of disparate data sets that we're all kind of looking at the same thing, but can't report it out. And of course, the one group of folks who tell you that you're completely off the rails are the biostatisticians and bioinformaticians who go, huh, why did you guys do that? And you'd be like, I don't know, never, you know, we didn't think about it. Um, so doing it with some intention in a prospective manner, I think is always a desired way to maintain that. And that's where we get stuck. We get stuck because we don't have a really wide ranging global database. Of course, we have SEER, you know, that's in itself a very tried and true database throughout the US. And there are several others, uh, the claims databases, there are many throughout the US that's been referred to, but the ones that we want are somehow tethered to medical records for clinical outcomes data. Those are ones that are probably the hardest to secure um, and everyone has a different mission, therefore impacting in a way how the data is really collected and how over how long. You know, some data sets are only good for a brief period of time and some are good for 20 years. But in oncology, the main struggle is we don't have the same sort of contemporary needs set of data because 10 years ago, we didn't treat cancer the same way as we do now, and even five years ago. So we now also, to complicate the quality of the data is what's impacting that, and that's all of the newer treatments uh, that may impact sort of what that data is. So that's a struggle, uh, I, for sure, from a, from a practicing sort of clinician standpoint. It's a huge struggle every day. Um, because our medical record system is only as good as what it is for that particular version. Um, and one little upgrade can disrupt many. Um, and we in academic institutions have not sort of built that infrastructure for a global data warehouse. You know, the um, uh, president um, recently announced the cancer moonshot. Um, 
uh, I, I smiled a little bit because uh, in in announcing it, he said, um, you know, we're going to take the next 25 years. I'm like, oh, that's not a moonshot. <laughs> that's walking. Um, we want to go faster than that. Um, and data is, is really the key to it, isn't it, right? Um, that we have to figure out uh, how to address the problems that Dr. Heath is talking about. Um, and that that is about building a good archive. And as I said earlier, a good archive is capturing data not because you want to answer a particular question. What you want to do is support the researcher so that when the researcher has a question, um, you have data there. It may not be the exact data they want, uh, but it will get them further down the road than they are right now. And so my case would be, if we're going to do a cancer moonshot, we better start laying some foundations with some good data uh, in order to accomplish that. Otherwise, it's just going to be a bunch of one-offs, and we're not going to get very far uh, doing that. Hi, Joy. I see you've joined us. Uh, would you like to chime in? Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to, I was, I'm, I'm over here taking notes because everything that's been said is just so um, on point and exciting. I, I was a little bit remiss in the intro, John. I just wanted to jump in to say that um, I am also, I, I'm CEO of Cancer, Executive Director of, of the Cancer Gold Standard. And in that, also really helping to launch a program um, called Going for Gold. And I'm mentioning that because it's important and because um, Dr. Page um, is actually brought to us or we, we got connected with her um, because Dillard University is a going for gold university. It's a program that it's a partnership, I should say, that we launched last year. And we currently have eight schools, HBCUs that are um, that have pledged to go for gold. And what it is is taking our gold standard accreditation that was designed for workplaces and uh, expanding it to be uh, relevant, applicable, helpful to university campuses so that they can apply it to their student body, their alumni, and of course, faculty and staff. And it's looking at cancer care, oncology care um, from the full continuum, from health education, navigation, to advancing treatment, as like we're talking about having representation at clinical trials, and survivorship and well-being. So there are five pillars, and I'm saying all that to say that we're, um, we talked about representation. All the things that we're talking about in developing data is so critical. And one of the reasons why this program or this partnership, I like saying that because to me, partnership means sustainable. And, um, and it's, it's important to us because we want to be able to make sure that we are in and around and in, in helping to influence positive results and outcomes in communities that need it the most. So when Dr. Puckman talks about zip codes, and Dr. He talks about is it you know knowledge deficit like how do we really operationalize data collaboration and make it make sense and um, so I just wanted to mention going for what I'm thrilled to look at our participant list and seeing some of our going for gold schools represented on here um, and and uh, this conversation is so is so just so critical to how we really take the data and make it apply we have it we're all interested in it but how do we make it um, really work and translate and get representation from a diverse population that looks like how we look. I mean, how the how the country looks, you know. So it's so critical. So just wanted to mention that. No, thank you, Joy. It's so important. I, I just got to jump in, Joya. You know what you guys do, and uh, for the folks on the webinar, it's that's where it starts. I mean, it's going to take all of us in a grassroots manner to get that conversation to continue. You know, there have been previous conversations. I think many of us here today have been at this story, not just for a year, but for decades. Um, and in that sense, have sort of built a, a credibility of sorts that we're in it for the long haul. And I think that's the part where people who are somehow part of this journey have to recognize it's not going to be fixed in a short time, that it does take a major investment out of all of us you know, one of the things that has always been really deficient and the struggle, I guess, in terms of having a large database that everyone dumps their data in with some common data elements is just, and I'll, I'll say it, you know, from an academic standpoint, it's hard to do that because of how our promotion and tenure process goes. So if you're a young faculty and you need to move on this uh, promotion trail, you must publish and to publish you must have access to some sort of data 
Um, so before anyone else gets their hands on it, you will do that and then move on. In a lot of ways, the uh, TCGA database, you know, which again has been a valuable resource um, for all of us working in genomics, um, really was able to be shared with the public after all of the uh, different um, manuscripts were completed. So I say that to be realistic today. I think we want to have some real tangible steps as to how could we change this conversation. I think it starts with the way we view academic medicine and, you know, getting those little like, yes, well, you published that, so goody for you, you can move on. That is not a group think or group success, you know, maneuver. That's a one individual being independent and getting his or hers, uh, you know, journey moving ahead. So. The conversation there in terms of, um, you know, that disparity of what is the perceived good or outcome is always going to be a struggle if we don't change that. As a lot of the oncologists, let's say I can only speak for cancer, a lot of the oncologists, um, you know, that are invested in this game have to sort of report to a different team. So I don't know what Dr. Pucker thinks about that. Oh, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, uh, I can list you other examples of why people hold on to the data, including the government itself. Sometimes we talk to government repositories and they want to answer research questions and so they don't want you to see the data before they answer their own research questions. And, and that gets to the heart of the problem. You know, um, the historian me will give you a little historic example. It used to be in the feudal age, every feudal lord uh, put up a toll booth on his land, right? And so when the nation state began to form, there were all these toll booths that just disrupted commerce. And so uh, uh, the, the king, in, in, in the case of England, had to come in and get rid of those toll booths. Uh, some kind of way we've got to affect that in, um, in, in healthcare data. We need to get it flowing uh, because that's how we're going to learn. Uh, and the more toll booths we have, the slower the process is going to be. Um, I don't have that answer on how we do that because uh, careers are built around the data itself, as you suggest, um, which makes it harder um, to, to get it moving. But it also is not for the public good, which is what you're also suggesting, uh, that in some way the public good has really uh, got to be the priority here uh, because um, lives get lost because we're not going as quickly as we should be going. John, I just want to say one thing, and I'm going to jump off camera, and, and I, know I see some questions coming in, but um, I just want to say, when when one hears the words, you have cancer, you or, if it's you or a loved one, you don't really care from who or where the data came from. You just care that the data exists, and that somebody's done something with it, that there's a treatment, that there's an opportunity, that there's a trial, that there's something for you. And I am humbled to see the attendee list. I would love seeing the registration list for this call, because it really is going to take all of us. and um, the participants on this call, I, I, I'm a little humbled to see some of the people that I've worked with before, but just the groups of people that are coming together to make sure this happened, um, that that data collaboration is, is happening. And um, maybe we need to get Nike on so we can just do it. But I mean, I think that it's um, it's a really good um, show and demonstration of the, the effort and the desire and um, how everyone's eager to get us to a good place. So anyway. I think, thank you, Joy. It's really great um, that you jumped in. Uh, before we move on from, from this idea that, you know, these data should be used for the public good, I want to, uh, to touch on, I, I read this article recently, it was called Dr. Caleb's Big Idea, which is about the idea of taking the identified clinical trials data and just pushing it out into the world. And that's, you know, that, that idea is what brought Project Data Sphere into existence in the first place and something that we've been uh, advocating for for it's coming on seven or eight years now uh, we've made some progress there we think that this is a tremendous uh, value that could be given to humanity to have these data available for people to plan better trials for people to you know identify new aspects of, of the patient journey in cancer and um, I guess you know there there are a number of barriers to this obviously because it hasn't happened yet but I I think it would be something that, that would be a tremendous opportunity or boon for all of us, uh, for, for the world at large to have 
probably the um, because these data come with certain things. They come with with quality assurance. They come with um, uh, traceability back to where they came from. So uh, there's an audit trail and and these aspects of, of uh, and then since 2012 or so, they come with some standard formats, um, which are all things that are necessary and, and things that don't exist in these real world data assets as of yet um, when you go across institutions. So um, I guess I just wanted to, uh, to put a plug in for, for supporting that idea. Um, I think it's, it's a, could be the, one of the biggest impact things that, that would come out of the next few years. Um, if, if Dr. Califf were able to, to pull that together. Um, John, can but, I, can I interject yeah, go ahead. that, you know, what you guys are doing in Project Data Sphere is exactly what those of us in the field have wanted to happen for many, many years. Um, and I, I know there's some questions in the chat, you know, regarding sort of how do we make this happen? Well, let me give you just an example of um, a presentation a few days ago um, of looking at um, using machine learning and using AI technology to look at a particular groups of many trials that have been run through the uh, NRG, which is another cooperative group. Um, so you say, well, how can these guys do that? You know, look at all this data across. Well, because they're all under this one big umbrella of the M NRG. Theoretically, this could be done with other cooperative groups or, you know, other organizations. And I think one tangible way to sort of figure out a next step um, similar to what you're doing is to kind of ask or at least um, suggest, encourage, whatever is the right verb, uh, for larger groups like cooperative groups that have been doing this for two decades and beyond to really take that same approach and see what you can do once you sort of ban all that data together. And it's a, it's a fine line of encouragement to, we really want you to do this to, this is just now the rule, to this is the expectation, to actual policy. Um, and I recognize that, you know, we don't say policy changes or new policy being developed lightly because this affects everyone, but maybe that's where we need to go. And I'm not sure, I like to ask you just in terms of policy, you know, how Project Data Sphere is thinking about whether you're delving into that world or kind of not. <laughs> Putting you on the spot, John. <laughs> well, I think we support good ideas and this is a tremendous idea. Right, and so, you know, what we can do is is to you know advocate for it. We can we can say that this is something that would be a tremendous boon and create use cases for it, like you're suggesting that NRG has done um, with with their own meta analyses. Um, so I, I think that there is no shortage of questions. I think that the the uh, the challenge is how do you prioritize those. And how do you identify enough um, people with the the right training? I think that this was a point Dr. Page wanted us to make: is how how do we bring educational institutions into this in a meaningful way to build programs that train students to ask these questions, to be able to carry out this work? Uh, and so I, I know uh, she had some thoughts on that, uh, but I think having having a data resource such as all the clinical trials in oncology, you know, would would open up um, so many exciting opportunities that it could be a pull to get students uh, there. Um, and and I don't know. Um, I'm just rambling now. I would really love somebody to jump in and kind of pick this up. So I always believe things like this really are a matter of will. Um, it's not capacity. We could do it if we want to do it. Um, it, it. We don't have. We don't need new science to do it. Um, it's it's really uh, we just have to come together and say this is important uh, uh, and we have to accomplish it uh, and uh, bring the right stakeholders to the table uh, and work through the problems that are the barriers right now for keeping us uh, from doing it. I think that's our future. I, I think you know um, we're getting very very smart, right? And we can get even smarter quicker uh, if we put the systems together so that. Uh, uh, we can learn, uh, and um, you know, the, the the barriers that we see come from a different age when 
uh, when we didn't have the capacities uh, that we now have. And so we have to reform ourselves, reimagine ourselves in order to do it. And so I, I think this one's just, this is a will one that um, the, we don't have to build new science. We just have to um, put our minds to it and get it done. I know one of the frequent topics that come up when we do go down this road of, you know, how do we all collaborate together is the dreaded question of who owns the data. And we sort of not address that. So let's go head on before the end of this <laughs> webinar, because, you know, that's usually the ones where everybody raises their voice saying, well, we paid for that trial, so we own it. or. Well, I contributed truly my blood, sweat, tears, and any other body parts to that. So as a patient, I own it. Well, you know, I'm the one that made sure it all happened right as the investigator, so I own it. And many grants will actually ask us, what is your data policy? What's your data sharing policy? And all of that are a lot of words that are sometimes quite hollow um, because it's all just dependent on the situation. I don't know if any one entity owns the data. I think the better question to sort of reframe that is, what can we do with this valuable data to help people live better and stay healthier? Um, and how we get everybody to that, whether it's a summit or through the CEO roundtable or getting the stakeholders, I think there has to be that first step that almost has to be not a mandate, but a real life expectation. Perhaps it's pushed by advocates. You know, we have not really talked about their role in all of this, but their role is underdeveloped. Um, in general, those are the ones that are, you know, vocal enough and invested enough to make that difference, who with proper sort of, you know, here's the training, here's where the deficit is, can go out and make this happen. They've certainly been successful in other avenues in cancer care and in healthcare. Um, I think there's probably, if there is a step to have, it's maybe to get the advocates from different organizations to come together to say, we want this. And if the community wants it and there are number one stakeholders, maybe others who are still arguing on who owns that data will come together and actually answer their stakeholders. Dr. Heath, I, I, I love that idea. You know, I, uh, uh, I think advocates can do so much uh, because uh, they're so focused on the, on the patient and getting good outcomes for the patient that um, their task is to break down barriers and, and create opportunities. So I think that's a really good first step is to get the advocate community um, to think about uh, and, and, and be a voice in this because I think they can transform. I, I agree with you so much. Yeah, and there's so many organizations. It's, you know, some are cancer specific, some are disease um, like agnostic. It's more of a support group, but everyone has a voice. Um, and if I think we count, I'm not even sure if there's a national database for all of these advocacy organizations um, you know, but even if you stay within the cancer realm, there are probably over several hundred that we could um, even identify on this webinar alone, just from all the experts that are on. But maybe to have a national summit, and I'm going to turf that back to the CEO roundtable. No pressure, no pressure at all, Joya. Um, but um, as an active step, right? I mean, who knows? Let's let's come up with something really tangible we can accomplish and in a virtual setting no reason why it can't happen well i think one thing that maybe uh maybe we should disclose is that as uh, the ceo roundtable and project data sphere we are in a public private partnership with the fda and for several years we've had um, an fda project data sphere symposium and so this is under discussion and now i think you've kind of advocated for it that this should be you know the focus of this year's uh, conversation with the FDA and that symposium is usually about a half day event um, where we bring together panels like this and, and a couple keynote speakers um, to really address these issues head on. And Dr. Heath, that's what I, I love about about having you here is to just say, you know, let's let's not uh, beat around the bush. We're going to we're going to just say that that's the elephant in the room and uh, it needs to be front and center. So thank you for for bringing that out. But but this is um, 
this idea of how to engage advocates and really empower them and through advocates to build something that serves all patients or right? because advocates at the end of the day have kind of a I don't know exactly what I want to say, but I think that they're the tool set that's available. It needs to be, we need to be more active in saying these are tools, these are pro, these are avenues and things that we as experts, you know, maybe see and have that that could help amplify the voices of the advocacy groups. Because in pediatric oncology, there are a few hundred advocate groups, right? And they're all brought together under an umbrella organization. I think it's the CAC2 or something, Childhood, um, or I, what is it? Coalition for Advocates Against Childhood Cancers. And um, for the uh, rare lung cancers uh, with specific genomic alterations, there are a, a dozen different uh, groups of, of, of individuals and patient advocates there that target specific this is Mtrek and this is Ross One and this is Alk and this is Met, you know. And so, I think this idea of bringing these groups together and and helping amplify the voices and pointing the ship in in not a singular direction but but kind of a, a harmonized set of directions um, could be something that would be a wonderful boon. Um, and and showing the winds, John. I think. You know, getting folks together is fine, but if you can showcase success stories. So at some advocacy organizations have been great in changing guidelines, let's say for preventative action, um, such as lowering maybe the, the colonoscopy requirements um, and what age. Um, some other organizations have been successful in getting grant funding increased uh, through the federal government to say there's not enough money in research, you know, we need more to sustain that um, that innovation. Um, and there are other organizations that have just been, you know, very vocal in, um, let's say, uh, standardizing quality of life measures so that when we move forward and share our information, it's done in a way that's, um, you know, cross-cutting uh, all the different so, you know, at a summit where advocates can really see the win uh, in the last five years, not even over 20 years, that will probably empower them to say, all right, well, how do we get this will to actually go forward, as Dr. Buckman suggests, and kind of, you know, not worry about who owns that data or how do we clean it up? Because to your point, what you guys have shown in Project Data Sphere is the common elements that I was referring to has already been done. You know, many of us have to go by standard uh, NCI, CTCAE criteria and reporting. Most of our publications are sort of done in a similar way. So having that all there just in the last five, 10 years, I think could also show it's a very doable next step. It's not so uh, large. And maybe we target it to either one disease type that need this information or you know, each company can cough up one sentinel trial, or maybe it's an immunotherapy type question. I'm just putting out my wish list to anybody who's listening. <laughs> Count me in, whatever you guys say. Um, but these are burning questions that when we write, and I'm a person who writes these clinical trials, you know, for patients, we want to make sure the question is actually relevant and that what we're doing matters. And that's where it comes down to full circle that it's just so critical to have this data set the knowledge. Well, this is the lull. So I think um, I'm gonna take a look at what we've got a few questions come, that have come in from the audience. And I think probably the, the one I'd like to just hear both your thoughts on is for, for those uh, attendees, for those folks who are not you know experts or who are not um, in the data analytics space, what what can be done, right? How can they get involved and to really move this forward? Um, so, Dr. Puckerin? Um, I, I think Dr. Heath gave the answer, which is they're advocates. Um, they have a voice. Um, they, they need to, to use that voice 
uh, to to help us uh, break down those walls. Um, you know, it's not even a technology question anymore in terms of of, of making the data available to um, you know you can put it in a cloud and 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 uh, there's technology now so that the formatting can be different and and still get reasonable searches uh, done through the data. So we have the capacity uh, to do it. I think uh, Dr. Heath is, is spot on. Uh, we all have to become advocates uh, for it uh, and, and, uh, and get it done because this will save lives. We, we will get smarter quicker uh, if the data is, uh, is available for us. Uh, and it, it's not a one and done. I think we've got to set it up. Um, because I think Dr. Heath again is right here that the world changes. It's changing so quickly, the data need changes, and so the system has to be able to keep up uh, with, with the changing knowledge base. Um, so there's real work to be done um, here, but it all begins, I think, with good advocacy. Uh, and, uh, and I think we can, can really put something together that's truly worthwhile. Yeah, and for those of you thinking, how do I actually get to an advocacy group? Um, you know, I'm all about the practicalities of that uh, of that question. Um, if you, wherever you are, uh, wherever you live, there's probably an NCI cancer center near you in your state. There's at least one in each state. Where in Michigan, we're fortunate to have two. Um, but in each cancer center, there's now an office of um, health equity or community engagement, however they're phrasing it, but there is that office where you can become a community action member, you can become a full-fledged advocate, and they train you to do that. You can just become an observer and uh, start to log in to your local cancer center and what, what are they talking about? Um, each one, again, true to Dr. Puckrin's uh, initial um, discussion was about geography and how it's all different. Wherever you are in the United States, their narrative for that cancer center will be different. And it should be different because if you're serving the community right, it should really reflect on the problems of that particular community. So wherever is happening in Detroit will be different than Atlanta, will be different than New York. Um, but each of those centers have a capacity to um, either let you watch and observe or fully go all in. And they will welcome you with open arms, open arms, if not many gift cards, because they just love you. <laughs> so they got me there. Um, but the other way is if you say, okay, that all sounds theoretically great, but um, the cancer center is about four hours for me and that's not practical. Remember, we're in the virtual age. You can just, you know, zoom in. Many centers have now sort of made their um, lectures and everything else a virtual base. The other part is the National Cancer Institute. If you actually go on their website and type in Minority Health, they also have resources for you to connect with if you want to learn more. Each of the parts of the United States is, is broken up into different regions. So within those regions, there are resources that you could tap into. Perhaps some are closer to where you are. Um, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes not, but those are just ready to go. You can click on your website right after this, this uh, webinar and learn more about it. And then of course, if you have a particular passion on the disease type, they would love you because everybody wants more folks to get engaged. Uh, I can say for the DU space, we have many organizations, whether it's prostate, bladder, or kidney, uh, that are uh, up to the challenge and would welcome all of you uh, with open arms. So for that first step, there's lots of different options. All right, well, I see we're coming up on the hour here. I just really um, want to give each of you a moment to, uh, if you have any closing thoughts that you haven't shared. I know we've had quite a, a ranging discussion, but, um, but please, if you have some closing thoughts and then I'll close us out. Uh, Dr. Heath. I just wanna thank you, John and Joya and everybody who attended today and also to Dr. Puckrin. I've learned a lot here. Um, you know, uh, we've been thinking about zip codes, Dr. Puckrin, for a long time because we deal with SEER and everything else, but this has really become, uh, as I say, a full circle moment because I have to reframe my own thinking in terms of cancer with that uh, what you just educated me on. So thank you for that. 
Um, I think for all of us, we have to continue this conversation. This is a series of conversation, month after month, year after year, and we can't let our focus waver. You know, the science is exploding around us in oncology. Every 24 hours, there's a new finding. 24 hours, I don't know how our medical students are keeping up, um, but compared to 60 years ago where the data would change maybe once every five to 10 years, we have changing data every 24 hours. So to keep up with that innovation, we have to be nimble, but most importantly, we have to continue this conversation and discussion and recognize the importance. Without adequate representation, especially for all of the newer genomic sets of data, um, we're gonna even be worse off than we were with just standard demographics. We're gonna get further and further behind and the recovery is going to be at some point, you know, not doable. And I don't ever wanna get to that point as that will not serve the patients that I treat or the community that I live in. So I just wanna make sure that we all stay true to this mission and have more conversations like today. And again, I just wanna thank the CEO Roundtable Project Data Sphere for you guys carrying on the work as well. So thank you. Uh, I, I would second John and and and, uh, and Julia. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I, I, I would close with a little focus on the on the issue of of disparity. Um, so what's happening in the minority community, specifically African Americans, is that they're getting late diagnosis for cancer, uh, and so they're being diagnosed with late stage cancer, uh, which means that their survival rates are poor. Uh, and what we think about at the National Minority Quality Forum is stage shifting, moving from uh, late stage diagnosis to early stage diagnosis of cancer. Uh, the only way we can stage shift is by data. Uh, we have to be able to understand uh, where is, are things breaking down um, so that we're getting these late stage diagnoses. And when you live in the data long enough, you, you realize it's all highly predictive, right? These are not random events. These are highly predictive events that if we pay attention to them, we'll know where to uh, intervene. So it all really begins with the data if you want to do something about health disparities. And that data is about collaboration. We have to come together. And I think Dr. Heath is so right. Um, it's only going to go quicker because our knowledge is exploding and we have to have a system that's able to keep pace uh, and our healthcare system right now is not being able to keep pace. And data is one of the places uh, where um, uh, you see it. Thomas Kuhn wrote um, about the paradigm shift uh, when the old system begins to have these flaws that you can't fix inside the old system. It creates the paradigm shift. I think we're in that moment uh, where we have to re reimagine how we want to do things if we're going to address things like health disparities. I couldn't have said any of that any better. You know, we are, we're building for the future and that future is acceleration. That future requires focus and that future requires everyone to come along. So thanks everyone for joining us today. A special thank you to our speakers, Dr. Pucker and Dr. Heath. It's just a pleasure to, to hear your thoughts and to hear you riff off each other. Uh, thank you to this uh, wonderful audience and uh, please uh, follow up with us. We want to build this into uh, some persistent program of effort uh, where, where we can help uh, these organizations, Dr. Puckrin's organization, Dr. Heath and her practice deliver on this, this hopeful future. Uh, so thank you again and please have a great rest of the day. Take care everyone. Thank you.